Hey guys, welcome to another High Performance Academy adventure. We're here at the Material Mord shop in Schleverdingen in Germany, and we've just landed. We thought that you might appreciate a quick tour over Paul's Evo 9 drag car, just to uh, have a look at in detail at what makes a world-class four-wheel drive drag car tick. So follow me and I'll show you through all of the parts. Up the front here, we've got a custom-made catch can that Paul's manufactured himself. With these high boost, small displacement engines, they're always going to breathe, and what that means is there's going to be some blow by and some oil will make it into the catch can. You can see at the bottom, he's added this nice little AN fitting, which makes it really handy and quick to drain the tank after a run down the strip. Moving along, you can see that this catch can's actually mounted to a custom tubular subframe. Now there's two reasons for doing this. One is it simplifies the whole front end of the car. It's much easier to work on, it's much easier to get the engine and gearbox in and out, and it also saves quite a bit of weight. So that runs from the factory chassis rails across. In front of that you can see we've got mounted this really large intercooler. Now despite this engine running on methanol fuel, where a lot of uh, drag racers will go without an intercooler, we like to keep the intercooler in the system. It keeps a more consistent tune because your intake air temperatures are always re reasonably consistent as the car goes down the drag strip. For example, without an intercooler with high boost, it'd be quite easy to see 150 to 170 degrees centigrade in the intake manifold. And basically, simple physics, power hates heat. So the cooler we can keep the air, the better. Now just back from that, you can see this north-south cross member that Paul's made up here. It's made out of chromoly, and this is the main north-south north cross member that holds the engine and the gearbox. Now, this is something similar to what we did with, with Project DS9. First of all, the factory cross member is quite heavy. Secondly, one of the most common maintenance uh, jobs we're doing on these cars is pulling the gearbox in and out. That's either to inspect the gearbox components themselves or also to inspect or replace the clutch plates. So because we're doing that so often, we want to make that job as easy as possible. So this cross member is a lot narrower, it makes it a lot easier to drop the gearbox out and it saves about 6 to 8 kg, so that's handy as well. Now moving back, we can see here we've got this huge custom alloy fabricated sump. This is actually manufactured by AMS in the States. A lot of guys with drag cars will tend to go to a dry sump lubrication. Dry sump lubrication is the ultimate. An external pump outside of the engine draws the oil from a huge tank normally mounted inside the car and force feeds it through the engine. It's great because you don't have to worry about uh, oil running away from the pickup. There's always a good supply of oil so uh, lubrication is always guaranteed. It is very expensive, it's quite heavy, and it's also quite time consuming to, to set up a dry sump system. So we found with Project DS9 that a, a, a modified wet sump worked really well. So this is what we've got here. This is from AMS, as I said. It's a larger capacity sump, so it takes more oil. So there's a lot more oil in there to do the job for a start. There's also baffles in it to help the oil stay around the pickup. So that again reduces the chances of us seeing oil starvation on a hard launch. Okay, moving back, we've got the transfer case. Now this is one of the weak points in the Evo 4 to 9 drivetrain, particularly when you're punching out a thousand plus wheel horsepower. We had a lot of trouble with the, the transfer case in Project DS9. We went through a lot of iterations trying to find the perfect answer. Um, in the end, we never really got a bulletproof result. What we ended up resigning to was changing the crown wheel and pinion basically after every time the car went to the drag strip. Paul's good friends were John Shepard from Shep Trans over in the US. So John Shepard sent over his stage three which is the biggest, baddest transfer case he does. And he's no stranger to fast uh, Evo 9s in that he sponsored the AMS car. So that's the transfer case. Coming off each end of the transfer case, we've got the front axles. Again, in a high-powered drag car, these are a weak point. Um, Paul's gone with the, the pretty common solution, which is from the drive shaft shop in the US. They're made out of a material called 300M, which we found in our own car and in DS9 is just about bulletproof. So these are one of the few parts in a car like this you can just about fit and forget. Moving to the outside of the drive shafts, we've got the factory hubs. Now, 
You can see on Paul's car he's fitted a smaller set of brakes. Okay, the Evo 9 normally comes with really large diameter rotors and also the big bold red four pot Brembo calipers. All of that's great if you're doing circuit work and you want to repeatedly slow the car down from high speed. We don't care about any of that. We only want to make sure we can stop the car once at the end of the drag strip. We also have a parachute to help do that. So to try and get some of the unsprung weight out of the car, Paul's gone with a much smaller diameter rotor. It's much thinner and it's also coupled with a much smaller four pot Whirlwood caliper. So this is ample to stop the car, but as I say, it wouldn't be up to the task if you wanted to take the car circuit racing. Moving back down the car, Paul's replaced the factory three-piece steel drive shaft with this aftermarket two-piece, which uses a carbon fibre rear section. The advantages of this are, first of all, it's a lot lighter than the factory steel drive shaft. Secondly, it's a lot more reliable. A slightly more subtle point as well, the carbon fibre tends to absorb the torsional loads that transmit through that drive shaft, so it doesn't sharply transmit the torque into the rear diff, it does so smoothly, and this can help keep the drivetrain more reliable, keep it together and stop it breaking teeth in the rear diff. Another feature we've got back here is Paul's rear mounted radiator. Now with a methanol drag engine, we're only running this engine for perhaps uh, 10 or 15 seconds at a time. With the methanol fuel, it tends to stay very cool anyway, so we've run these cars in the past with no radiator at all. That can work, but it does put a lot of stress on the driver because you've constantly got to be watching your engine temperature, deciding when to start the car to move into stage. If your, your opponent in the other lane has a problem with, a with his car, and sort of messes you around on the lights a little bit, you can have trouble controlling the engine temperature. So for the small amount of complexity and extra weight that goes into it, having a small radiator just is, is nice for peace of mind. So for making everything nice and easy to work on, Paul's mounted it all the way back here at the rear of the car. And you can see he's made up these two really nice alloy lines that run the water uh, from the radiator forward to the engine. So there's the convenience of not having the radiator at the front of the car. So you don't have to pull it out every time you're actually working on the engine. It makes a lot more room in there because we've got quite a large turbo manifold and quite a large intercooler. You can see there's a small electric pump here which circulates the water forward through the engine. So it's not actually using a mechanical pump on the engine anymore. And we've got a fan to keep things cool when, when it comes up to temperature. Moving back further, we start off the whole rear floor section, including the underside of the back seat, has been cut out and replaced by this one-piece carbon fibre moulding. Again, that's just simply to reduce weight out of the car. Definitely not too much chance of Paul carrying around people in the back seat anymore in this car. The rear of the chassis rails have also been cut out, again, just for weight saving. There's no sort of crash protection or anything back there and nothing rare of this, this rear subframe is, is doing anything structural with the car, so we just didn't need it. I wanted to just talk a little bit about this custom tubular rear subframe that Paul's got back here for the rear diff. Now, the factory subframe is, is a pretty complicated piece of equipment. It's really heavy, it's really cumbersome, it's hard to work on. The other thing is it mounts the rear diff itself using rubber bushes. Now that's a problem because when the driver dumps the clutch on the start line, the torque's transferred into the rear diff and those rubber bushes let the, the diff actually wind up. So it doesn't transfer everything straight into the axles and then into the wheels. So this chromoly two frame subframe, it removes all of that factory componentry. It solid mounts the rear diff the um, alignment of the diff is perfect and it can't move, so all of that torque gets transferred straight into the axles and then straight into the wheels. This rear subframe actually drops a total of 20 kgs when compared to the factory rear subframe, so that's huge in a car like this when you're chasing every last kg. Getting the wheels aligned correctly on a drag car is just as important as making power. We want all four wheels pointing directly ahead and what we want to do is minimise the amount of camber uh, as the car squats. Every time the car moves into negative camber, what it does is it minimises the amount of 
tire that's actually contacting the racetrack. So if we can keep the camber set at zero, that's going to mean we've got the full contact patch of the tire on the ground the whole time. When we lower the car, particularly when it squats, the factory suspension doesn't give us enough adjustability to do that and it's inevitable we'll end up with a degree or maybe a degree and a half of negative camber. These adjustable lower control arms let us get rid of that and we can set the camber perfectly. Lastly under the car we have this custom mount here for the parachute. So that's something you're only ever going to find on a drag car. Basically once you get up to around about 150 mile an hour most of the governing bodies require you to fit a parachute to the back of the car to help you slow the car down. So this bar here is a chromoly bar that ties the two uh, pieces of the rear subframe together and it just extends backwards and makes a nice, safe, secure mount for the parachute. One thing that's quite important with these parachute brackets is um, the height that they're mounted on relative to the axle line of the car. Because there's really nothing in the back of this car, there's not a lot of weight in the back, it can be quite easy for the chute to actually pull the rear end of the car off the ground if it's mounted too low. So we need to make sure that the chute's mounted um, high enough that that's not going to happen. For online tuning courses, visit learntotune.com.